We'll start our study this morning in the book of Colossians, chapter 3. That's where we ended last week. Colossians, chapter 3. Can someone remind me what all we talked about last week or what some of the things are that we talked about last week? Say again. What is evil? We talked about what is evil. We began talking about man and how we would describe man, man being uh, in our nature evil. We talked more about last week, that was the week before and the last week we went into really getting to evil and, and our response to that. So we've been kind of walking through this progression of things here. So we're going to pick up where I, I don't know if we read all of this last week. I know we, we touched on it though. So let's pick up here in Colossians chapter 3. If you'll read verses 5 through 10 for me. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, conspicuousness, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things say the wrath of God cometh all the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked sometime when ye moved in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communicating out of your mouth. Lie not one to another that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So this passage of scripture is talking to us as as people. The old man, put off the old man, put on the new. Um, we've talked about who is man and, and evil. The world wants to say that man is basically good. That was two couple of weeks ago, a couple of Sundays ago. If man's basically good, then it must be something else that's causing the struggles and the evil. That's what man's going to do with that. That's what we have done with that in our culture. Um, as opposed to looking at the biblical concept that uh, man is sinful, therefore we're e evil, we're born into sin, and uh, there has to be something different um, for us. But it starts out, my, my question for us is, for today is a starting place. It starts out in verse 5 there. It says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then it names some of those sinful things. So why are we called to this level as, as the people of God? Why are we called to the level of mortifying, putting to death? Why do you think we're called to that level of action against those evil deeds there? Because, you know, if we go back to 1 Corinthians, look at that passage of Scripture. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so what does that mean for us? A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. What is that, what's that giving us understanding of? Mm -hmm. That's right. That, that leaven is going to take over. If we allow the leaven in our life, that sin, it's going to take over. A little leaven is not content with just being a little. It's going to be much. And you cannot serve two masters. You'll... you'll Love the one and clean and hate the other is what um, it says in the Sermon on the Mount. Why else? Why else does the Word of God call us to this level of activity as believers? It says to mortify the deeds, mortify, and therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Why does it call us to that level of action? There's probably no wrong answer, so what are your thoughts on that? I feel about you can choose life or death and blessing of the curses. That's kind of what I thought about. Right. And so if we're not choosing life, if we're choosing, if we're not mortifying these members, fornication and uncleanness and all those kind of things, then um, with the scripture that Brother Ryan's pointing to, we're choosing death is what we're choosing. Instead of choosing the life that God has, has given us and the abundant life that he's established for us to have while we live in this world. It doesn't make just common sense to choose death instead of choosing life, but... But we do as humans. What well, some other thoughts about why God calls us to that level of activity of mortifying, putting to death these members? Go ahead, Brother Brooke. Yeah, we like to, in our human nature, we like to straddle the fence. When you're straddling the fence, you want to you want to do one thing. You want to call yourself a Christian. We want the blessings and the benefits of the grace of God in our life. We want the blessings of God in our life. But we still want to straddle the fence and do some of our own <clears throat> things that please us. Um, and, and God's call here, God's word tells us to mortify, uh, which is put to death. And so it's a clear separation. It's clearly getting, cutting away those things and, 
and um, getting them out of our life. What else do you think it tells us to mortify? That's, that's a very strong wording that it uses there, and I think it's, it's important for us to kind of pause and consider God's Word calling us to mortify, to put to death those things. Why does it call us to that level of activity? That's my question for us. Because it causes leaven. That little bit of leaven is going to cause more. And because we cannot serve God and mammon, two masters. Because our flesh wants to straddle that fence. But God calls for zero tolerance. These things will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why else? Brother Travis said, because we're pilgrims in this land, and we're not to be conformed to this world, we're, we're passing through it, there's two sides of that coin. I think he brought up two really good points. One, we tend to think that the, when the flesh wants what the flesh wants, we think that's good. Uh, we think that's sufficient, or it's going to sustain us. We're not designed to be sustained in this world. We're not designed, we're not created in the image of God for us to find comfort through the things of this world. And if that's what we're looking at, and we're not mortifying the, the works of the flesh, the things that are enmity with God, then we are looking toward some of those things to give us the peace or the comfort that we have. So Travis's point is, is to not be conformed to this world, and to be transformed. Now, there is a principle taught in God's Word that there must be separation in order for there to be unity. We must separate ourselves from the things of the world and the works of the flesh in order for us to be unified with God, for us to be... Um, followers of Jesus Christ you know and so we can't be conformed to this world we can't let ourselves be after these things and um, and at the same time be content with God and walking with God like we are called to any other thoughts on why God's word calls us to that level of mortifying uh, our members which are upon the earth and yeah, where does judgment begin according to God's word yeah, the house of God, with God's people. And so if, if we as a, a body of believers, if we as Christians, professing Christians, if we're not active and mortifying, putting to death things like fornication and uncleanness and in order to affect those things in our own flesh and then also amongst us um, as we hold each other accountable and love on each other, then um, the wrath of God, that judgment of God begins with us. All right? Um, and we can get into a whole discussion on the judgment of God against the children of God who, don't, who tolerate um, these kind of things. So There's a whole lot more answers that we could give to that if we stop, if we just continue to think that through. Why does God's word call us to the level? Here's a verse in um, the Gospels. It's talking about the kingdom of God. <clears throat> it says, um, the kingdom of God suffers violence... And the violent take it by force. I'm not going to turn to that passage of scripture, but tell me what that what does that mean? Can a violent person take the kingdom of God by force? Scripture tells us it can. So what is that talking about? If we could prepare that here with with uh, Colossians three five, tell us what that's really pointing to. What that might be pointing to. Yeah, there's a violence against that mortifying. It carries with it the idea of of killing and, and putting to death. These acts of the flesh. Um, that's how we ought to, we ought to um, feel. So, so the world, in our, our worldview kind of series that we're going through, so to speak, right here, the world looks at man and says that man is basically good. Um, I, I can't remember. Did we talk about Maslow's hierarchy a couple weeks ago? So Maslow's hierarchy is, uh, Maslow's a psychiatrist, psychologist. Um, he's, he's spent his life trying to determine kind of what makes man drive and tick, the psychology of man, and what makes man healthy and all that kind of good stuff. He did it without the concept of God in the picture. But, but what are the bottom rungs? Man, every man, he says, every man needs, what does he say those bottom rungs are? Do you remember? Yeah, those bottom rungs. Yes, those basic needs, such as food, clothing, and shelter. So, so he creates this, this triangle, Maslow does. It's a hierarchy of needs. <clears throat> And he says, okay, so man's bad because of these things, uh, if they don't have these things in, his li in their life. And so he says at the bottom, you can't expect a man to be good if he doesn't have clothes and fooding and, and shelter and those kind of things. And so those have got to be provided for that man, for mankind, in order for them to be able to be productive citizens. And then he, he moves right on up 
on that hierarchy of different levels of needs. And as we get more and more of those needs met, the, the, the concept is the healthier the individual is going to be. That's the psychology. Do you remember what that top, those who studied, remember what the top um, echelon of the hierarchy of needs are, the very top peak? It's self-actualization. Tell me what that means, Sister Logan. <laughs> we'll have a class on that at work this week. No, <laughs> no. tell me what self-actualization is, somebody who's, who else has studied that. It's a very popular school of thought in, in child development and, and human development and growth and that kind of thing. So, Doris, what is self-actualization? I'll put you on the spot. Getting to a place where you're happy with who you are and comfortable with yourself. Yes. So that school of psychology says that you are happy, you're content, you're good in life, there's no evil when you accept yourself for who you are. All right. Whenever you know yourself well enough to know, okay, this is who I am, this is what I'm... How does that play out in our culture today? That idea of self-actualization. We take it at that elementary level. There's, there's more pieces to it we could talk about, but at that rudimentary level, how does that play out in our, our culture today? What are some of the common phrases that we hear or the direction that we give mankind to self-actualize? You were born that way. Okay, you were born that way. There's nothing you can do about it. And so just accept who you are because you were born that way. All right? That's one of them. I think about like the I am enough thing where you don't need anybody else, you don't need Christ, you're enough on your own. And that's a perfect phrase that fits in that self-actualization mindset. I am enough. You know, I can be content in just myself. There's no need for anything else. And so, what are some of the other things that we hear? What's our culture? What has mankind done with the idea of self-actualization? If we just take that, um, I am enough. Who I am, how I am, I'm enough. How does that measure up with Colossians 3.5? What do you think? Because we're doing a worldview series. So I'm not asking questions because I want you to think about things. Not just sit up me, sit up here and give you a bunch of scriptures that you go home the rest of the week and do nothing with. Because you encounter all of this stuff on a weekly basis. If you're watching TV or video clips or movies, if you're engaging with other people in this community, um, you are dealing with these worldviews. And if you're not thinking about what is being said to me, you know, let's just take, let's take, um, follow your heart. I'll just take it. That's, a, that's an easy one. I think easier one for us to think about. Follow your heart. All right, let's just compare that. I want you guys to tell me what that might mean culturally and what God's word says about it. Let's start with what it might mean culturally. Follow your heart. Things do what you want to do, but God's word says the heart is deceitful. Okay, absolutely. So. Brother Ryan went ahead and compared both of them. Follow your heart means do what you want to do. Does that sound good to any of us in the flesh? Yeah, I want to do what I want to do. Right, so that's that's a man-centered worldview. Finally, somebody's got out of my way. So independence, I can follow my own heart. I don't have to have somebody else telling me what to do and how to do it and all that kind of good stuff. I'll do my own thing, finally. Whereas God's Word tells us, what, Brother Ryan, what did you say? Yeah, Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know? And so we need to remember that aspect of our heart condition. That's the biblical worldview as opposed to a heart that it can self-actualize. Just The more that we get our needs met, the better we become, and we can grow content. If all of us would just get to that place of self-actualization, then we'd all be happy. No, it's not true. Any other thoughts about following your heart or anything like that? Comparing the, the worldly idea with Scripture. I think that you are nothing. Like you're not going to be more of anything. If you accepted all those things about you, mm -hmm. you're not going to see the need for more of That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You're not going to see. If I'm enough, I'm content with just as I am, why would anybody tell me that I'm not good enough? We can get staunch in that kind of position in our flesh. Um, what was the old... <clears throat> I don't, I, I'll, I'll come up with that phrase in a second. There's an old phrase. Um, but if I'm content in just who I am, then I don't need to mortify the flesh. It, it negates then that need to say something's wrong with me. I'm not enough. Um, there's a problem here. That problem is sin. And we need to be mortifying 
um, those members that's in our that wars against us as members in our flesh that's contrary to what God's word says. All right, so I'm going to move past that. We've got a bunch of questions today for you. I mean, we will turn to some scriptures here in just a second. But, um, last week we talked about evil. Where does evil come from? Okay, tell me what. So Brother Lee hit it right on the head. He said from God. What does that self-actualized self do with that? What does the world do with that? They agree. Why do such bad things happen to such good people? Because God is just a God of wrath, and he just wants to destroy us all, make us all miserable, right? That's what the world does with that. That's not what Brother Lee's talking about. That's what the world does with that. A lot of the world would agree with Brother Lee quickly with the wrong worldview. So, Brother Lee, what are you meaning by that? He allows it. I guess he allows it. So, what his perfection is for his will. Okay. Absolutely. So, in the idea that God allows, we'll take that for a second. Some of us are going to feel uncomfortable with the word allow there. The idea that God allows, why would he do that? Someone besides Brother Lee, he's already been talking. Why would he do that? So that we can see our need for a perfect God. Absolutely, I agree with that. So that we can see our need for a God who is who in him is, is perfection and goodness and nothing evil. Okay? So where else does evil come from? If we talk about God, where else does evil come from? Okay, ourselves. And see, the world doesn't want to think that. Um, in ourselves... Um, Maslow, uh, Carl, these are psychology people. I had to study all these. Maslow, Carl Rogers, Adler. Um, their basic tenets of psychology is that people are evil because the culture has made them evil. So where does our culture come from? Let's just ask that question. From people. That's absolutely right. Your culture is made up by the people. So if you say people are only evil because the culture has made them evil, you're saying, oh, the people who are evil has made you evil. It's just a circular kind of thinking that makes no sense whatsoever. All right. Um, well, where, where else does, does evil come from? Brother Drew said from, from people, which it does, because we're sinners. Where else does evil come from? Remember Isaiah 45? God says, I, because our Brother Lee's quoting from us, I, God, make peace and create peace. <coughs> Evil. Right, so it's, in that verse, it says God creates. Yes, Isaiah 45, verse 7. Let's read it together. Right, Brother Ryan, if you'll read that. 40, Isaiah 45. Read verses um, 6 and 7 together for us, Brother Ryan. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So what is God's word telling us there about him creating evil? What does that mean? Let's, tell me what that, what do you think that's talking about? We talked about it a couple weeks ago, so I'm going to have a long pregnant pause for you to think. What happens when God creates evil? I didn't think, I thought God was perfect and good. I didn't think anything evil could come from him. Is that true? It is true. Nothing evil can come from God. Remember that? So where, how does, why does it say he, he creates evil? Or he, uh, yeah, he creates evil there. What happens? So I want, you to re- I want you to log this in your memory. Don't forget this truth. Because it answers so many questions. All right? In the absence of God, what is left? Evil. In the absence of God, there is darkness and there is evil. All right. So when you're facing something that is evil, what do we know? God is not there. It answers so many questions. All right. Why is there so much evil prevailing in the nation of America today? Huh? God is not there. In the absence of God, when he says, I... Form the dark, so I form the light and create darkness. We're going to look at a verse about that in just a little bit. I make peace and create evil. When God removes his spirit from something, from a church, when God removes his spirit from the church, what's left of the church? 
evil, darkness. Because to be apart from God, that is all that's left is darkness and evil. It's a dichotomy in this world. And if you'll just remember that, where does evil come from? It comes from God when he removes his presence from that, that place or that heart or that mind or that, that church or that nation, those kind of things. That's the judgment of God. That's the severity of God's wrath against sinfulness and ungodliness is to remove his blessing, his presence, and what's left in its place is darkness and evil. Why is it important for us to mortify the members that will tend to rule and reign on, in us and on this earth? Because the only thing that's going to be left if we don't is the absence of God, which is just pure evil. All right. Every one of us, our, our lives individually, or our marriages, or our families, or our businesses, or our, you know, I keep going on through the list. Every area of life that we encounter, we engage in, or that we're a part of, our school system, our, just keep building it. In the absence of God, what is left? Evil. Okay. I just want you to, that's, that's a worldview that God's word establishes for us that we need to hold on to so that we can be just as black and white. If something is presenting as evil, it's because uh, evil is defined by God's word. It's because God's presence is not there. Now, the world will call good evil and evil good, you know, and so we got all the confusion that the world does on that. But if it's an evil as, as defined by God's word, it's evil because God is not manifesting his presence. You know, our, I, I work at Court of Three. Uh, I work as the executive director. Um, there's all kinds of problems that we deal with constantly. Uh, there's other worldviews that tend to come in. There's pastors who have their own ideas about it. So we have to constantly guard. I have to constantly guard and raise up the standard of God's word. And if I didn't do that, if I didn't, if I didn't say, no, God's word says, and I didn't hold to that standard, then do you think that, how long do you think it would be as a Christian ministry before God would remove his, his spirit from us? It wouldn't be long at all, all right? Um, because we're professing to be Christians. And we profess to be the word of the, the, the a ministry of God, and so it wouldn't be long at all before God would remove His Spirit from us. But that's true of any brother. Jarvis runs a business, and he's not out there um, holding the Word of God as the standard for how they do everything, because that's not the focus of the business. His business is about moving packages. But if he says in his mind and heart, you know, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it this way because it makes me more money. What's going to happen to his business? Is God going to bless it? Not at all. God's going to end up removing his spirit from that business, and Jarvis is going to be struggling to make ends meet because God's not blessing him. It's a dichotomy in God's word. It's something that's black and white for us. There's no gray area on that. Now, God is long-suffering toward us, which I'm very thankful for. He's full of mercy toward us, which I'm thankful for. But when we look at man, God's word says, mortify the deeds, or mortify these things in Colossians members which are on the earth because it creates that separation from God and, uh, it's, and, and there's evil left in its place. So, so it, it begs the question, if God creates evil, it begs the question then, who is God? And I want us to spend time with this the rest of our time today. Who is God? God is good. All right? God's word tells us that. He is good. So how has he been good to you? Such a Logan. Everything you have, he's been the provider of that. It's a way to look at that, absolutely. God is good. What else would you say? Who is God? Okay, let's turn to that one, Exodus 3. Exodus chapter 3. Now, we're doing this kind of worldview series, a way to how, how are we viewing the things going on in our world. So let's just put, let's put our shoes in, um, in Moses' let's put our feet, rather, in Moses' shoes for just a minute. All right. Uh, he's fled, at this point that we're looking at, he's fled Egypt, raised up as, as an Egyptian. So what's the worldview that comes out of the Egyptian world? You know, we can think about that. But not only that, he was raised up in Pharaoh's house. So he had, he had all the privileges that came with that. And yet he chose to be identified as a Hebrew. So he fled after, after the murder of that um, Egyptian um, lord there. Fled out to Midian. He's, um, he's been in the, in the wilderness of Midian for 40 years now at this point, and he has this encounter with God. 
So his whole worldview experience is being an Egyptian and being someone on the run. That's, that's the way I can summarize that at the moment. And now he comes to God, or he, he's face to face with God now. He doesn't come to God. God comes to him face to face with God. And God's given him a work to do. Go back into Egypt and deliver my people from those Egyptians. Now, if we're thinking as a man, as a human, what do you think, what would you do in that situation? Let's just think from, from worldly idea of man. Uh, a worldly idea of man for a second. What, what's man going to do in that kind of situation? I'm comfortable. I, don't I think that's one of the common things. I'm comfortable. I don't want to. I've got a wife and kids now. Don't take me away from my wife and kids. And I've got a job here. I'm a, good, I'm a shepherd. It's going pretty well. Don't take me away from what's easy and what's good. It's taken me 40 years to build up what I've got right here. Don't take me away from what I've labored for 40 years to do. You know, we can, all kinds of ways that we can word that. But that's, that's in our, our fleshly nature to be established in those kind of things. And so we encounter God and God's word. We're like, nope, not going to do it. What is, the, what is you think Moses' idea is of Egypt? What's this, this man's perspective of Egypt there? If, if, you're, if God, you're telling me to go back to Egypt, what would you what would be in the flesh? What would we think? Egypt's too powerful. Yeah, that's a mighty nation at this point in, the, in history. Uh, one of the biggest nations on the face of the earth. Um, they're too powerful. It's one of the ideas that we have, that we would have. That I can't go up against Pharaoh. And Moses feels those things. You see it here in this passage of Scripture. But it comes down to Moses finally saying, so who are you, God? You know, who am I going to say to the people that you are? They're not going to believe me, so I've got to have something that represents who you are. And you see Moses going through that, and he says, he says to God, what shall I say unto them about who you are? So um, verse 14, Brother Brooks, read that for us. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God is so yeah, awesome in the way he answers things. So let's just take my question earlier was, Who is God? The answer was given, I am. He's the I am. So let's just talk about that. What does that mean for God to say, I am? I am that I am. I am. Let's just think about that truth with scripture from a biblical perspective when God says I am brother Walter what might he be pointing to there what is he saying to us everything okay I'm everything I'm what you need I'm everything I have everything that you need absolutely what else some of the other ones what else would you say why does God say I am Say again. Was and will always be. Yeah. So, so Brother Jarvis is pointing to the eternal nature of God, the infinite nature of God. He always has been, and always will be. What are you What are you specifically attacking there? Do you remember our, our discussion about four weeks ago? What does Carl Sagan say? Do you remember that about the cosmos? Cosmos is all that is, ever was, or ever will be. No, that's not true. God is the one who all that is, ever was, and ever will be. He's the I am um, kind of individual. What else for you, thinking through Scripture, thinking through a biblical worldview, what does it mean for you to hear God say, I am? So the first one Brother Ryan said is, He is light. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. Right, Brother Ryan, read verse 5 for me. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. So tell me what that means. We're thinking things through from a biblical worldview. My question to you is who is God? Rook says he is the I am. We said several things. Brother Ryan just said he is the light. So what does it mean for him to be the light? Tell me what let's talk about that for a second. He is the light, and in him is no darkness at all. What it pairs with it there in verse 5. What does light, what does that word mean? Let's just start with that. Truth. Truth. I think so. We're going to turn to that verse in just a second too. Truth. Biblically it means truth. That's a very good definition for it. What else is light? What does light do for us? 
guides our path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, light unto my path. Light unto my path. It helps us to see. It exposes things for us. So God's doing all these things. We're describing the word light. That's what he's doing. That's who God is. That's what he's doing for us. Helps us to see. He exposes things to us. What else does light do? Beautiful. Light is beautiful. All throughout the course of the day, we're looking at the sun. From the sunrise to the sunset, um, all the things that it does, God's light is beautiful for us. His created light, but also him, more importantly, the light. It dispels the darkness. That's one of the characteristics of light. Disinfects. Say again. Disinfects. It disinfects. Okay. That's a good one. I have to think about that one a bit more too. Yes, it does. So when you're answering the question, who is God? We can just take that one, for example, or take I am. He's everything that I need. Uh, I need food. God's provider. I need clothing. God is my provider. I need shelter. God is my provider. I need self-awareness. God is the one who's going to make me aware of myself. Okay. <clears throat> he is the light. He's going to disinfect and expose for what it is. He's going to show me the, the majesty of his beauty. He's going to... <clears throat> That's how we are supposed to think. And we're examining who God is next to who man is there should be a stark contrast because God the light exposes man for the sinful nature or God the I am exposes man as uh, impotent who needs to depend on a heavenly God um, we could take all of these things and see um, that battle that exists between what our flesh thinks and what we want as opposed to what God's word says all the way through God's word uh, he's exposing he's revealing himself to us so that we would have we have the ability to think. The scripture says, I'm not going to turn there. I've got one more verse I want us to turn to, but the scripture says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we need to think with the word of God. We need to think with the mind of Christ, which is the word of God. And as we're thinking about things, we need to consider God is light. We're asking ourselves, who is man? Well, we need to consider who God is. And man's completely helpless, helpless without him. We can't even know ourselves without him. Let's do one more verse about who God is. Go to John chapter 14, book of John. All right, Brother Drew, if you'll read verse, um, verse 6 for us. My question is, who is God? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay, so there's... Four things is declared in that verse about who God is, who Jesus is in particular. Um, what are some of those things? Who is, who is Jesus in this verse, which is God? He is God. Let's pick one of those. He is the way. As this morning said, he is the way. That's who God is. He's the way. So let's talk about that for a second. Let's just kind of unpack that just in our thought process, thinking of Scripture. When Jesus says, I am the way, what is he, what is that, what is he revealing to us through his identity there? Say again. Okay, he's the one to follow. Does man say follow me a lot? Mankind say follow me? I think so. All the time. All right. We think that we know the answers to things. And so if you'll just follow me, uh, I'll lead you to prosperity. And there are preachers who preach that. Follow me and I'll lead you to prosperity. But Jesus says he is the way. What else? He's the one to follow. What else does it mean by him saying to us, I am the way? Okay, when Jesus says, I am the way, he's saying, I am the source for us. I think it's a great, great answer to that, too. I am the way. Um, he says there, the next one, I am the truth, which is what I'm really after in all of this. So I use this verse last. Tell me what that means when he says, I am the truth. Yeah, if we want to know what truth is, where do we need to go? To truth. We can go to truth. He says, I am the truth. As opposed to anything else. Anything else is going to be, at, at best, a mirror of the truth. At worst, a flat-out lie. 
in darkness, evil. We as believers, we can be a mirror of the truth, but we, won't, we do not want people to come to us because we are not the truth. Right? We're the bearers of the truth, bearers of that message, but God is, Jesus is the truth. So I'm doing all this. It may be a little bit of a different kind of study today. Um, I didn't walk you through as much scriptures. But this is what I'm wanting you to do. We're, we're taking these questions. We've, we've covered some content. And we've got to begin to ask questions. What does this content mean for us? We're talking about different worldviews or, or, or having a biblical worldview. What is the value of knowing Jesus Christ? And yet we don't think with what his word tells us is true. We think we still think with what Abraham Maslow has told us man is, or what um, the world today is telling us man is. All right, there's no value of knowing Jesus if we don't apply what His Word teaches us about Jesus Christ. We must be careful because we are in this constant battle between truth and lies. Right? Um, we're in this battle between the flesh and the spirit, and so we have to constantly ask ourselves what. What does God's word say? What is the mind of Christ on these situations? And as we think with that mind, we're going to be led in the right direction. Right. And I think the two biggest battles that we have today, of course, it's the flesh and the spirit. But in our worldview today, man has said this is who, who man is. It's elevated the idea of man that we are capable, we're competent, and, and man, we can plow through. The, the American idea today is that if we can just get America back to hell, we how we were in terms of our patriotism and our but if we do that without Christ man it's, it's going to be a disaster worse than what it is now because that's pride and arrogance as opposed to in the spirit or thinking of God's word if God's people first would humble ourselves and pray and seek the face of God and turn from our wickedness God would be the one who would heal the land and create this great change and God would be the one who receives all the glory for it. We have to think like that because that's what God's word tells us to think like. Do you see the difference there? So I'm just driving that point home as we've been doing our studying so far. The reason we're talking about man and evil and, and those kind of things is for us to begin to think differently about this culture that we live in and to think with the word of God. So I, that's my soapbox there at the end. So. Any thoughts in closing? I didn't cover a lot of scriptures today. I just covered a couple of questions. Man, evil, and who is God? Any thoughts in closing? Going back to good and evil, those are both spiritual terms that the top would have That's exactly So right. when people that are not looking towards the word, and they try and play God to find good and evil, it leads to the confusion problem. Yes. Yeah, but brother... Michael's response there is phenomenal. It's spot on. God's word is what describes. God himself is what defines evil and good. And when man tries to do anything of that sort, apart from God's word, it's just more and more confusion and chaos and darkness and evil that's going to come out of that. So, all right, let's close out there for the day. I